Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you may have uh, guessed by the unfortunate, well, fortunate for me, but unfortunate internationally name, I'm coming from a uh, Slavic country which uh, likes and loves to put lots of consonants next to each other. So actually, I come from the beautiful town of Krakow, which is in Poland. I'm an assistant professor there. And I do research on uh, cyber diplomacy and international law. And I have a research project on digital sovereignty, which is, I guess, why I'm here and what I will try to convey to you. And I also do other stuff like cyber capacity building for international organizations. So the topic of today's talk is digital sovereignty. And I thought I would do this in three or four parts. First, we need to set the baseline and talk about what is digital sovereignty, what do states think it is. Secondly, we will talk about, well, what is the nature of the problem. Secondly, what are the risks connected to that. And lastly, we will look at possible solutions. What can states do? in order to meet this challenge? What can companies do in order to meet this challenge? So let's start with digital sovereignty first. And you may have heard this buzzword. It has been a very political word. It has been used, at least in, your, in the European region, but also outside of it, by the highest authorities. It is part of the European Union's strategy for the digital decade or digital age, where it is said that Europe must strengthen the digital sovereignty and set standards. This is what Europe always likes to do, set standards. And of course, you know, the commissioners also speak of digital sovereignty being central to European strategic autonomy. So two buzzwords that politicians love to use, uh, love to use digital sovereignty, strategic autonomy. But it is not only the Europeans. If you think back some years ago, you will perhaps remember that since the early 2000s and later since the 2010s, the Chinese spoke about cyberspace sovereignty in the context of internet governance, where they said they do not want to support global hegemony by one particular country, they would like for internet governance not to be a US-dominated multi-stakeholder process, but rather an international process under the International Telecommunications Union. You may have noticed that Russia also speaks about sovereignty in the context of the internet. In 2019, they promulgated a law on the sovereign internet, where Russia has prepared to route all its vital communications through nodes and servers completely within Russia, so as to be independent from the outside internet in case of espionage or in case of outside malicious interference. And as a final example, the French, as good Europeans as they are, they have put a lot of thought into that, and they have come up with the way to save their digital republic by the name of souveraineté numérique. So, digital sovereignty. So, all those states talk about digital sovereignty, but do they mean the same thing? What do states mean when they talk about digital sovereignty? And if you take a look at the laws and documents and policies, you will see that digital sovereignty does not denote one thing. It can mean lots of things. It can mean, for instance, the avoidance of global control over the internet in favor of a multinational approach. It can mean, as the Chinese do, defense against cyber hegemony. But if you look into the interests of other states, you can also see that Digital sovereignty can have its form of data sovereignty, which means the protection of data, be it personal data or business data, against access to it by foreign law enforcement. It can mean 
the regulation of the internet nationally, the increase in technological capabilities, this is the link in the European Union at least between strategic autonomy and digital sovereignty. It can mean the protection of territorial sovereignty, linking back to the discussion that we heard just before, where you know, one of the big concerns is the violation of national sovereignty through digital means, through offensive cyber operations. And it can also play a part in monetary sovereignty. Think about Facebook's attempt to establish a digital currency, the Libra, which did not come to pass so far. But why did it not come to pass? Well, because certain countries have voiced massive, massive problems with respect of a private currency that would be issued globally, arguing that this would indeed violate their monetary sovereignty, so the exclusive authority of the state to issue legal tender. So all of this can mean digital sovereignty. And so what I propose to do is firstly to boil it down to the core and then to look at some selected examples of where this may apply. So what's the nature, what is the nature of the problem? Well, the nature of the problem is first that cyberspace as it is designed is borderless and therefore it has blurred the clear lines of state authority. Laws apply, apply within the territory of a state. Treaties apply to the territory of a state. However, what do you do in an environment that does not recognize traditional physical borders? What do you do in an environment where tracing the route of packages is a challenge? Where law enforcement, for instance, says that um, uh, basically they are dealing with the problem of loss of location, so that the location of the data is indetermined, it can be moved freely. What can we do about that? The second part of the problem is that due to the borderless nature of cyberspace, technologically dominant states, so states that have companies registered there which have you know, advanced technological capacities, can also exercise regulatory and enforcement authority across borders. What does it mean? Well, it means that if you have big, and we will talk about the example of cloud service providers, if, we ha if you have big cloud service providers that are registered in your country, you can issue laws forcing those cloud service providers to grant you access to the data not only located within Japan, but also potentially located all across the world. Or you can try to enforce. If the data, for instance, is stored in a uh, server within the European Union, you can nevertheless force the cloud service provider to apply your own law in order to hand over this data, in order to delete this data, and so forth. So if you are a technologically dominant state, life is good, right? Your influence grows beyond your borders, beyond the traditional capacities that the concept of sovereignty gives us. If you are uh, a technologically less developed country, what do you do? And I was, a month ago, I was doing cyber capacity building in Laos and Cambodia. And of course, you have not heard about big cloud service providers coming from those countries yet at least. But they face the, the big challenge that they are receivers of technology from China, from the US, but also receivers of regulation from outside, simply because those cloud service providers, the uh, digital service providers, are regulated by the laws of foreign countries. So, if you are in the position of a technologically weaker state, you are dependent on services, companies, and hardware that do, you do not fully control by your own laws. You can try to promulgate a national law, but then the company may simply exit your market and you do not have access to this type of technology. Let me give you a practical example from a region that I know well, namely the European Union. The European Union depends 
almost fully on cloud service providers of the big type, Google, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, etc., which, as you know, are all incorporated in the United States of America. Now, the data can be held in data centers within Europe. It can be held in data centers outside of Europe. However, due to the fact that those cloud service providers are incorporated in the United States, the United States exerts legislative control over those cloud service providers, which means they can, by legislation, get access to European data wherever it is stored outside of Europe or outside of the US or even within the European Union. And this is thanks to a piece of legislation called the Cloud Act or the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act. Now what this legislation does is it permits US law enforcement to access data held by US registered cloud service providers independent of the location of the data. So if you ha have your data on a server owned by a US registered cloud service provider, even if this data is located here in Japan, you are potentially open to US law enforcement should US law enforcement require one of the big US cloud service providers to hand over this type of data. Furthermore, there are no immediate notification obligations to data controllers. So if your individual data is being requested, you are not, they are not obliged to inform you about that. And Japan as a state does not have under this act the possibility to object to this request for data. Objections can only be brought by uh, cloud, services, uh, cloud service providers themselves. Now, there is a possibility to um, sign a bilateral agreement with the United States, uh, giving some benefits, namely, for instance, also access to data uh, held by US cloud, services, uh, cloud service providers directly, which means that if the government of, let's say, Japan would like to get some piece of uh, data from US cloud service providers, you can ask those CSP di CSPs directly. You do not have to go through the mutual uh, legal assistance treaty route. However, the only possibility for this is you need, as a country, first to sign an executive agreement with the United States. Now, for a rule of law country such as Japan, this may not be a problem. For other countries, it may be a challenge. Now, to illustrate the scale of the influence that the United States gets by this, let me just give you a figure from the World Economic Forum which says that over 92% of all data, 92% of all data, all trillions of trillions of bytes, is stored on servers owned by US-based companies. So in consequence, while national law enforcement may have difficulties to access data stored abroad, this is not a problem for the US. National law enforcement in other countries loses control over its own data. And by storing it outside, you open yourself up to po the possibility at least of access to data by agents of other states. So the problem here is the loss of control by transferring data outside, coupled with the possibility of control by technologically dominant states. And I, I gave you the example of the United States, but of course there are multiple further examples. You have, for instance, the Chinese example, which in their state security law of the People's Republic of China require, if you look at the third paragraph, uh, 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 sorry, at the second paragraph, which requires all states, organs, armed forces, political parties, public organizations, and enterprises to safeguard the security of the state, which means there is a duty of cooperation for the public as well as the private sector with state security in China, 
in terms of safeguarding the security of the state. And the problem is that, of course, in this particular law, the concept of state security is not really clearly defined. So state security is whatever the state security services of China say it is. So the consequence, if your data is held on uh, service in China, but also if your data is operated on Chinese equipment, you open yourself up to the possibility of having to deal with potential Chinese access to your data with all the consequences that you know, the laws, at least as I read them, do not offer any robust rule of law and human rights safeguards that you would get still in the United States. So you are faced with a dilemma. Do I trust this vendor? Do I trust the uh, environment that this vendor offers? Should non-Chinese critical infrastructure operators run on Chinese hardware or software? given the risk that they have. So these are only the two examples that we have. Now, faced with these problems, states invoke sovereignty. Sovereignty comes to the rescue. Well, so what is sovereignty? Let's, let me put on my, my legal hat as a public international lawyer and let's give you a, a definition. Sovereignty, as the classic definition goes, means independence, and independence means your exclusive authority within a geographically defined territory. So what states are trying to do in this digital environment is they are trying to reassert this exclusive authority in their own territory at least, in order to protect themselves against those possible wide-ranging influences of other states, law enforcement, secret services, and so forth, over data that belongs to those states, that belongs to the citizens of those states. However, this is the traditional concept of sovereignty. And I told you, well, the traditional concept is a little bit challenged in the term of territory, because we do not have you know, these territorial defined boundaries. But what is new? is the aspect of capabilities, right? Are you sovereign enough if you do not have the technological, the technical capabilities to safeguard your own data? So if we define then the term digital sovereignty, we can look at two main ingredients. The first ingredient is the state authority, to preserve the state's right to exercise its authority in cyberspace uh, and to preserve its rights over, uh, of authority over digital tools to control data, networks, electronic communications, and so forth. You want to preserve your power to regulate. And then, on a political level, you would also try to achieve some kind of strategic autonomy in the sense that states are trying to gain the ability to make autonomous technological choices and to be able to develop and deploy strategic digital capacities and infrastructure. This is the reasoning behind everybody now investing billions and billions of dollars or euros in order to produce semiconductor facilities within their own regions, simply to keep up technologically. So where do we see those digital sovereignty strategies manifest themselves? Well, we see them in legislation requiring, for instance, data localization. We see them in legislation requiring national routing of data packets. We see them in legislation or policies uh, designed at re, you know, getting internet governance, not through a multi-stakeholder model, but rather through a multinational model like the ITU. And of course, being good businessmen as you are, you may already spot the challenges. While it may be important for states to assert their authority over their own and their citizens' data for very legitimate and valid privacy purposes, you know, 
uh, confidentiality purpose and so forth. The more you restrict free flow of data in terms of uh, for instance, data localization laws and so forth, the more costly business becomes and the more problematic it becomes for you to run your enterprise. Let me give you an example of one new uh, digital sovereignty model that is currently being uh, developed within the European Union. Under the very innocent uh, sounding EUCS or European Cloud Services Scheme. Now what this does is basically European legislation requires the um, European Agency for uh, f f Standardization, ENISA, to um, harmonize uh, certification requirements all over the European Union. You know, you have a big market of 27 member states, 450 million people, you would want to offer digital services on the same terms, you would like to have a common cloud certification scheme. Where you have different you know, certification levels uh, and so forth. However, what the EUCS cloud uh, uh, services scheme, as it is currently drafted, and this is a draft from June, it is still not adopted because there is political pushback, but this is the draft that we are working on. What it uh, also um, uh, requires or includes is a fourth certification level, the highest certification level, which includes not only you know, technical requirements for cybersecurity, but also includes requirements of a legal nature. So in order for a company, a cloud services company, to obtain the highest certification model under this scheme, they would not only have to implement basic or you know, high cybersecurity um, standards in terms of encryption and so forth, but also legal requirements that would protect the data held on the, their servers from unlawful access by foreign law enforcement. So how do they do this? What, what do they propose to do this? Well, firstly, they propose certain technical measures. So if you are applying for the highest certification, you would need to localize your data in the European Union. You would need uh, your cloud service to be operated and maintained within the European Union by employees located within the European Union. And you would need to implement measures that make you immune against foreign law. So for instance, contracts must be governed by EU law, not any other foreign law, US, Chinese, Japanese. And non, no non-EU entity may have effective control over the cloud service provider. What does it mean? Well, this means that basically if you are applying for the highest certification level within the European Union, you would need to be a European company. You would need, as a Japanese company, to uh, establish a subsidiary that is not fully controlled from outside, but rather uh, the effective control would need to be European. Now you see the business implications of this, right? It goes against free flow of data, it makes business harder, especially because, of course, if governments, through, for instance, government procurement schemes, for big projects would require the highest possible certification for you to be considered in any tender, you as a non-European company would be excluded from any type of uh, government tender within the European Union. Now, as I said, this is still a problem, uh, this is still under discussion, there, there is pushback from the more liberal-minded countries within the European Union, we will see what comes out of this. But this is a, in, an illustration of how far digital sovereignty uh, legislation can go. So what's the risk? Well, the risk is that we would have a splintering of the world economy and world cyberspace in several technological regulatory ecosystems. There has been a report from March 2022 by CSIS talking about two technospheres, the American and the Chinese. I would add a couple more, Japanese, Indian, and so forth. But basically, the risk is the world splinters into regulatory bubbles which do not communicate with each other, where business 
is made very difficult. And states are moving into this direction. You know, if you look at the European Union, the European Union is increasing its control, its, its regulatory control over infrastructure and data. It still has a limited control over the technology stack simply because the European Union is a technologically behind in terms of cloud services and so forth. If you look at China, we see the full picture. We have full state control over infrastructure and full state control over the technology stack. If we take a look at Russia, well, they have also full state control over infrastructure and data through the legislation. Fortunately, the technology stack is not so advanced in uh, the Russian Federation. So what can states do to meet this challenge? Well, let's go from problem description to potential solutions. Well, I would advocate two things. The first thing is like-minded states need to build trust. Right? The problem in a globalized world is the lack of trust in how the other state would exercise its own authority over the data that is held in their uh, area of control. So what can we do about that? Well, let's build trust. Let's, for instance, facilitate trust mechanisms for cross-border data flows, ideally by way of international treaties. Ideally, well, first bilaterally, but ideally then multilaterally, that would set common standards of regulation over data, that would set common standards for limitation of extraterritorial jurisdiction, where the exercise of jurisdiction within another country by one state in the territory of another state would be limited uh, legally. And let's agree upon standards for rule of law and human rights mechanisms to address the potential problems, the potential issues in terms of the transparency of the uh, access to data, the uh, you know, potential access to court, the fairness of the proceedings, and also, of course, the safeguarding of key human rights in terms of privacy. However, this is also important not only, of course, for only personal data, privately held data, but this is also key for business data. Because business data, data held by businesses, data held by uh, governments, non-personal data is the driver of the world economy. Figures show that only in the ASEAN region the data economy will, go, uh, will grow to $2 trillion by 2030. So this is you know, a, a very big chunk uh, of data and of course your businesses would want a part of it. And the second point, what can states do? Well, they should build trust through rules of responsible state behavior using ICTs. You know, when do I access foreign states data? What am I allowed to do on other states territory? Where do I need to respect the sovereignty of other states? This is currently being done within the United Nations. But also we need, as a counterpart, build resilience. We need to build secure and resilient digital infrastructure. Uh, we need to uh, build common internet governance to maintain an open, free, global, interoperable, reliable and secure internet. All right, so trust through common regulatory mechanisms, resilience, ideally also as part of the whole package. Now, is this being done? Well, let me give you some voice of hope, uh, invoking the example of the European Union and Japan. Uh, the European Union has already in 2019 uh, adopted an adequacy decision uh, on Japan. This is required under the European Union uh, GDPR regulation. Uh, so uh, if European personal data, uh, or let me start anew, European personal data can only be transferred, uh, transferred abroad to states that have adequate protections in terms of human rights, in terms of the right to privacy. And Japan has been declared adequate and both 
countries respect each other's legal systems and say that the protections for privacy rights are adequate. And now, just one and a half weeks ago, on 28th of October, Japan and the European Union have confirmed an agreement in principle on the free flow of data under the Japan EU EPA. So this is a very new document. I wasn't able to find the, the actual text uh, of the document uh, yet. I even went to, to your Ministry of Foreign Affairs yesterday, but they wouldn't give it to me. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a very important document where measures that would restrict data flows between Japan and the European Union, such as data localization rules, are to be abolished, are not to be applied in a, a mutual context. So the aim is to construct a predictable legal environment while leaving room for appropriate policy measures in exceptional circumstances. Right? So this is a model that has been championed by your government in the G7, the data free flow with trust model, and I believe that this is the way to go forward. Uh, and hopefully this standard will be applied globally. At least we have commitments by the G7 on this particular issue. And let's hope that this becomes not only a political commitment, but rather also a legal uh, framework. So this is the way forward. But how can, and I will close with this, how can companies meet the challenge posed by digital sovereignty? Well, firstly, what you would need to do as companies is to conceptualize the challenges coming from those digital sovereignty laws and data sovereignty policies and make it pivotal to any organizational strategy. Irrespective of whether you are a cloud service provider, at some point you will use the services of CSPs just to concentrate on data. And when engaging with third-party vendors or cloud services uh, providers, you need to make sure that you understand the applicable laws, and you make sure by contractual you need to make sure by contractual arrangements that data sovereignty concerns are specifically uh, addressed. You may want to include language of exclusion where data shall not be held, by whom it cannot be accessed, and so forth. But this needs to be drafted by uh, your company's legal teams. But also, in your you know, data flow model, in your business model, you need to ensure that the design pertaining to data transfer and transport the data flows adheres to data sovereignty requirements, both within your national Japanese legal framework, but also the legal framework of the other state and the applicable international rules here. So how to do this? Well, for instance, by implementation of data residency and location control policies and establishing data governance frameworks, policies, procedures, and tools. This is currently being worked on in terms of being a global, uh, being a global standard. You have seen the uh, attempts of the European Union to set a standard to follow by companies. But you need to be aware of this, and you as a company need to respond to this in order for your business to thrive, in order for your data to be able to be shared globally, or, well, not globally, but internationally, in such a way that this data is being protected. And with this, I have still some time left for questions and answers, if you have any. But in any case, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Arigato gozaimasu. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much. Now we'd like to take questions from the floor. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. We will bring you a microphone. Your hand. Our staff will bring a microphone to you. Hi. Do you setting it? Okay. Uh, my name is Iko Takahashi, a lawyer. In the previous session, 
we discussed uh, when there is a uh, packet attacking from outside the country, how will that relate to the privacy concept in Japan? And from the concept of digital sovereignty, it may be justified. That's something we discussed. But what is your view on this matter? Thank you. Thank you for the, for the question. Uh, so, in terms of outside attacks, you need to, to look at two different factors. The f first factor is how do I make sure, as a government, that the data of, of my citizens is secure? How does this fit within the digital sovereignty concept? And I would say, under the rubric of protection of territorial sovereignty, right? Uh, you yourself, as well as uh, Talita-san and, and uh, Nick-san, have uh, discussed the concept of sovereignty as protecting uh, the data held within the territory of a, of a state from outside interference. Now, there is a different level of standards. Some states say uh, that you know, any penetration attempt already violates sovereignty. Other states say only when this penetration attempt is successful and it leads to certain uh, physical consequences or impacts your government's authority or ability to, to, to exercise its sovereign functions. So there is still this, this problem. But I would say, you know, as one part, I haven't focused on this particular part in my presentation, but as one part of digital sovereignty, uh, this, is, this is also uh, applicable. However, of course, you need also to think about, you know, if you, just linking back to the, to the uh, roundtable uh, before, if you yourself do active cyber defense that reaches outside of your territory, and here I would just uh, like, well, perhaps not offer an answer, but pose a question. Namely, we have heard many Japanese laws applicable to uh, to, to nationally held data, and the question is, you know, how far does the Japanese law also protect data from foreigners held abroad? We see different models internationally. The German courts have said that wherever German authority is exercised, it is bound by German law. The UK, United Kingdom or US model, as far as I know, says that you know, actions abroad do not fall under the national constitution, and therefore there is a bigger liberty to act. So this would be also a question uh, for, for Japan to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the presentation. So actually, uh, when I hear the last question, I think of something. So, for example, if someone attack uh, and uh, a company in Japan which is holding uh, European nation data, so is it considered an attack to the Japan or is it considered attack to the European nation? <laughs> now, thank you, and this is an absolutely excellent question. Uh, if the let's say it is European data held on a server within Japan. The first answer would be, depending on you know, the definition of sovereignty, but there is a good case to make that this would violate Japanese sovereignty because Japanese, Japan has exclusive jurisdiction over ICT infrastructure within its territory. The current concept of sovereignty does not allow for Europe to claim sovereignty over data stored abroad, which means this would not violate European data unless this is some sort of, for instance, governmental data held abroad under some sort of international treaty. There is an example of, uh, by the country of Estonia that they have e-embassies, electronic embassies abroad uh, in Luxembourg, I believe, which have been established by way of international treaty and which have the status of archives under uh, the uh, rules on, on diplomatic law. So if those archives would be attacked abroad, there may be a violation of international law. But 
data of private citizens? So far, not. But this is yeah, an, an excellent problem that states need to, to think about. Thank you.